Okay, everybody, this is chapter 9 of the Reeves book, or as what he calls the best years. This is the period of time from about right after the war ended up into November 22nd, 1963, because that's where Reeves ends his kind of his writing on this period in history on uh, where Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. And, you know, that kind of started the era of upheaval. Um, and we started to see more protesting and uh, due to the Vietnam War, which we'll talk about soon, and um, also more um, kind of people chasing civil rights. Um, so we'll kind of touch on that. So there was growth and prosperity in this time. Uh, there was an emphasis on marriage and having a family and having a large family. Um, there were advances in nutrition and medicine that kept people alive a lot longer. And as you can see by the statistics, um, the number of people over the age of 75 jumped from 2.6 million to 5.5 million in 1960. Um, the population also grow, grew, and we saw the population rise um, by about 29 million people during the 50s. And the number of households grew from 37.5 million in 1945 to roughly 53 million in 1960. People started moving out west, you know, chasing opportunities out west. Uh, the population of the Pacific uh, states grew by 110%, and by the end of 1963, California was the most populous state in the country, and it still is today. You know, people migrating here, people um, uh, seeking jobs, um, opportunity, and also immigration into California caused this. Our income grew. The, nas the gross national product climbed from... Uh, 213.6 million in 1945 to 503.7 million in 1960. So, a very significant gain. Um, and gross national product is basically kind of the estimate of, you know, the total value of all your products and services turned out in a given period by people who owned um, means of production, which would be count the country's residents here unemployment was in the five percent range in the 1950s and inflation was about three percent or less a year and according to the text um, between 1945 and 1960 per capita disposable income went from 500 to 1845 dollars for every man woman and child um, i looked and the author doesn't really define what he means by disposable income um, the way i define Disposable income is roughly the money that you have left over after you pay all your bills. You know, money to go out to, for food with, money to go out to watch a movie, maybe a baseball game. Those are all, I think that comes out of your disposable income. Uh, but the, uh, Reeves doesn't really go in depth on what he means by that. We also saw automation take um, flight here. And automation was widely discussed at the time. We had labor-saving devices which increased productivity within factories and decreased the need for factory workers. And we became a more of a post-industrial society when at that time in 1956 that white-collar workers outnumbered blue-collar workers for the first time. White-collar workers are generally people that work in offices. Blue-collar are the ones that do, you know, the factory manual labor type jobs. We also saw a religious revival here in the United States during this era when we saw church construction go up, um, church membership go up, and between 1955 and 1948, I mean 1958, um, about 49% of Americans reported having attended a church or a synagogue in the past week. Um, and, you know, there were public opinion polls that kind of cemented this, um, in 1952, 75% of Americans said that religion was very important in their lives. Five years later, 69% thought that religion was increasing its influence on national life. And at the same time, 81% of Americans expressed the belief that religion could answer all uh, or most of life's problems. So just kind of take a look at that. Um, you can see that we're becoming a more religious country. Um, Eisenhower, who was president at the time, also inaugurated the White House prayer breakfast sought to establish a national day of prayer and open his cabinet meetings with prayer. The words under God were soon added to the Pledge of Allegiance and in God we trust became our nation's official motto. 
What's this all the building of interstates and freeways here? Uh, Eisenhower had asked the governors of each state to help and called on the U.S. Congress to pass laws that would get an interstate freeway system built. Um, he asked for a law that would build the interstate system in 10 years and not blow the federal budget. Um, everybody was pretty much on board with this idea. And, but the problem was not blowing the budget because it was going to cost about $27 billion. And in some instances, in order to fund this project, Congress would have to increase taxes on the products that motorists use, such as a tax on gasoline, a tax on tires, and a tax on trucks. Um, when we talk about the arms race, you remember we had used the, the, the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but there was also efforts to increase kind of the capability of technology with regards to military force and the fact that weapons were becoming more advanced. But Eisenhower didn't think that the United States should be an aggressor, but he thought that you should have weapons just to kind of have the capacity to strike back. And the Eisenhower administration kind of viewed atomic weapons as an integral part of U.S. defense. Again, not being the aggressors, but having the ability to strike back. The United States built up a stockpile of nuclear weapons and a nuclear delivery system to deter military threats. Again, that's probably the best way also to set up your defense is to have a stockpile of weapons to kind of show that there might be some retribution or some retaliation if, if a country is attacked. So starting in the 1950s, uh, medium-range ballistic missiles and intermediate-range ballistic missiles were developed for delivery of tactical nuclear weapons. And the technology developed to the progressively longer ranges eventually became the intercontinental ballistic missiles. And we'll use that term uh, a little bit later in this. So, um, Eisen Eisenhower also um, created a kind of a term that is still used today in the military industrial complex. So, let's talk about the military industrial complex. So, President Eisenhower's farewell address in 1961 warned the American public about the union of the federal government and the permanent arms industry that had developed during the Cold War and kind of the feeling that the government would be helping fund this military industrial complex. Um, Eisenhower noted that the U.S. spent more money on military security than the net income of all American corporations. And between 1950 and 60, the portion of the federal budget allocated to the military jumped from um, 33% to about 50%. And about 3.5 million men and women were directly engaged in working with these defense uh, industries. He said, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. So his concern was some of these agencies would have a lot of influence on whether or not we would get into a conflict. And here his farewell address for you to watch. So what Eisenhower is basically saying that we should not allow people that are motivated by money to take over the defense industry. So as far as defense, by 1960s, intercontinental ballistic missiles were developed that could reach targets of about 7,000 miles away. And by the early Kennedy years, nearly 300 huge ICBMs were deployed underground in various sites across the United States in a way to strategically prepare ourselves if we were ever attacked. In 1960, the submarine George Washington launched its first Polar Polaris missile, and soon a fleet of such submarines would be deployed carrying those type of missiles capable of reaching targets that may have been as far as 2,900 miles away. Uh, Secretary Dulles put much stock in the threat of using nuclear weapons, warning the communist world of a massive form of retaliation to counter aggression. And I think it's really dangerous in, in a sense to maybe kind of make these threats because anytime 
uh, you have the capacity to shoot this amount of weaponry, especially nuclear weapons, it's going to lead to mutually assured destruction. So let's talk about Vietnam. So Viet France attempted to reassert its authority over its one-time colony of Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnamese who had barely fought the Japanese during the war had sought their independence. Um, the struggle became part of the Cold War because of Ho Chi Minh, who was a popular Vietnamese leader who combined that form of or a form of nationalism with um, the ideology of communism. Um, at this time, politicians were afraid of what's called the domino theory. And the domino theory is the belief that if one country falls to communism, all the neighboring countries around it would fall also. Between 1955 and 1961, the United States poured more than a billion dollars into South Vietnam, mostly of, most of it military aid. Vietnam was divided to Burley at the 17th parallel, where Ho Chi Minh ruling in the north and a pro-Western government in the south. So a communist part in the north and a pro-Western government in the south. Um, the United States therefore began... Okay, so during this time, uh, the United States started to offer support um, to anti-communist uh, politician No Dinh Diem. And in 1955, uh, before this, the Republic of Vietnam was, was formed, there was a na nationwide referendum asking what type of government that did the, the people want. And it was chosen to be a republic. So after that, um, Diem canceled all the elections and installed himself as president. And it's funny because if you look at the the... Uh, the participation rate of this, the, the participation rate is 108% of the population. So it's a really funny thing that that, that happened. I, sorry, I got to chuckle off that. 108% um, participation rate. So a lot of people saw the DM's regime as corrupt and oppressive. And here's a picture of a Buddhist monk um, using extreme actions to kind of show this. And as you, the U.S. continued to prop Diem up, communist resistance activity in South Vietnam, organized by Ho Chi Minh, backed the National Liberation Front, or the Viet Cong, who were um, guerrilla and used guerrilla warfare in order to um, fight against who they saw as an oppressive government. We also had strained relations, strained relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, tensions were kind of escalated by the shooting down of a U-2 CIA pl spy plane. And with, along with the U-2 incident and um, Premier Khrushchev walking out of a Paris peace summit, um, tensions escalated, and it also escalated the arms race. So we saw the 1960 presidential election, and on election day, John F. Kennedy won with 49 Point seven percent of the vote to Nixon's forty nine point six percent of the vote. So a very very close election, and a mere one hundred and twelve thousand eight hundred three votes separated the two, and this was the closest election of the twentieth century. Um, um, yes, you can consider that um, blacks tipped the scales for Kennedy in several states, especially in the South, as he was very um, kind of cognizant of the civil rights movement and wanting to implement measures to ensure that African-Americans got civil rights. We're also on the brink of World War III during this time. Um, Castro, who was leader in Cuba, began expropriating foreign-owned businesses and accepting aid from the Soviets. Uh, the CIA secretly employed American gangsters eager to reopen their local gambling casinos and nightclubs to assassinate the Cuban leader. Um, plans were also laid out to mount an invasion of Cuba led by expatriates trained and supported by the United States government. Um, the decision to proceed with this or abort this invasion would fall to, into the lap of John F. Kennedy. As one of its last acts in 1961, uh, the administration severed diplomatic relations with Cuba. 
It's also an incident called the Bay of Pigs. So for the next two years, officials at the U.S. State Department and the CIA attempted to push uh, Fidel Castro from power. And in April of 1961, the CIA launched what its leaders believe would be a definitive strike, which would be a full-scale invasion of Cuba by 1,400 American trading Cubans who fled their homelands when Castro took over and had ousted Batista, who was the leader prior. On April 15, 1961, a group of Cuban exiles took off from Nicaragua in a squadron of American B-26 bombers that were painted to look like stolen Cuban planes, and they constructed a strike against Cuban airfields. However, it turned out that Castro was aware that the raid was going to happen and moved planes, moved his planes out of harm's way. On, on April 17th, um, in the Cuban exile brigade began its invasion at an isolated spot on Cuba's south shore ne ne known as the Bay of Pigs. Um, the CIA wanted to keep this a secret for as long as possible, but a radio station in Cuba on the beach um, broadcast every detail of the operation to listeners across Cuba as they knew that it was coming. Um, the CIA and the Cuban exile brigade believed that Kennedy would eventually allow the American military to intervene in Cuba on their behalf, and the president didn't. The president didn't want to provide any type of military aid to this action, and um, and he said as much as he did not want to abandon Cuba to the communists, he was not ready to start World War III. So as part of this... Um, Unexpected quarry sank some of the exile ships as they pulled in the shore, and paratroopers actually landed in the wrong place. Um, after not, not uh, before long, Castro's troops had um, pinned the invaders on the beach, and the exiles surrendered after a less than a day of fighting. 114 were killed, and over 1,100 were taken prisoner. So this is a colossal failure. We also had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and again, this had to do with tensions between. Cuba, the Soviet Union, and the United States. So Operation Mongoose was decided to do what the Bay of Pigs invasion failed to do, was remove the Castro regime from power. Again, kind of believing in that domino theory, that if there's one country that falls to communism, all of the neighboring countries would fall as well. And one of the concerns was that Cuba is only about 90 miles from the tip of Florida. So that's very, very close. Um, a little too close for comfort with regards to uh, some of our politicians here during this time. It was later revealed that more than 40,000 Russian troops and 270,000 armed Cubans were on hand at the peak of this crisis. And in late August of 1961, the Soviet government had assured Kennedy that the weapons that were in Cuba were strictly defensive and designed to protect Cuba from an invasion. Um, the challenge facing them was to orchestrate the removal without initiating a wider conflict and possibly starting a full-scale nuclear war. Again, also, when the United States did take an offensive position in well in Turkey, where they had missiles in Turkey aimed at the Soviet Union. And for the 13 days during that time, we were on the brink of nuclear war. We were on the brink of World War III. So JFK had sought to employ the U.S. Navy to establish a blockade or quarantine of the island to prevent Soviets from delivering additional missiles and military equipment. Second, he would um, deliver an ultimatum that existing missiles would, would be removed. And a compromise was worked out. The USSR, the Soviet Union, withdrew from Cuba, and the U.S. removed missiles from Turkey, which were pointed at the Soviet Union. So when we talk about JFK and Vietnam, um, President Kennedy had originally ranked Vietnam as the number one threat to the world stability in his speech to the UN. Um, there was corruption, religious differences, and mounting successes by the Viet Cong guerrillas that we talked about, which weakened uh, the government of No Dinh Diem. Diem was a Catholic, and public protest over the repression of Buddhists threatened the stability of his regime, and we saw that picture. And Kennedy started to accelerate flow of American aid gradually increased. Uh, the U.S. military advisors to more than 16,000. And at the same time, he pressed um, DM to clean house in his government and institute long overdue political and economic reforms. 
So that kind of leads us to November 22nd, 1963, or the date of Kennedy's assassination in Dallas, Texas. Um, this is kind of significant as this is where I like to kind of show that this starts what is called the era of upheaval and maybe the era where people kind of lost their faith or lost trust in government. Um, we, have, we as a people felt that Camelot was over and we started to enter a contentious society. Camelot was kind of the, 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 the euphemism that was used for Kennedy's administration where everything would be great for everybody, African Americans, people of color, um, men, women, gay people, and so on. Um, and it was a point in history where that ended and we started to face some real world problems and real world issues that divided the American public, whether it was feelings on the war in Vietnam or feelings about rights given to African Americans. If you ever have a chance, take a look at the assassination of Kennedy and some of the of the literature that's out there. Again, if you want to talk to me during my office hours about it, I don't want to say I studied it, but I've done a lot of outside reading about the assassination of Kennedy. And um, I have a really strong opinion on what truly happened. Was Lee Harvey Oswald the lone shooter or was it a conspiracy to kill the president? I have a certain way that I feel about it. So if you want to talk about it, again, we can make a, um, a Zoom appointment and definitely discuss it. But this is really, really a point where we started to see a mistrust in government that started and it was reaffirmed by the Nixon administration and Watergate, as well as the twin forces of that hippie counterculture movement w along with the civil rights era, civil rights movement. Okay, so if you have any questions, definitely let me know, and we will talk to you soon.